Hey everybody. So this video is going to be a bit different for me. I don't usually respond to responses, but Jay Warner Wallace recently spoke out about this video where I explained why the timeline of his backstory doesn't make sense. I'd suggest you go check it out. And I thought his reaction was worth getting into for a couple reasons. First, it gives me more time to unpack something I'd barely had time to touch on, which is how he uses insinuation. And second, his explanation is so conclusively bad I wanted to do him the disservice of amplifying it for him. Seriously, he would have been better off just letting this one die, but it seems he couldn't help himself. Basically, his response to me revealing he wasn't a cold case detective when he converted was to say that he'd done some cold case work before joining the cold case unit. And that just... doesn't work for him. I'll talk about why when I break down his response a little later. But before getting into that, I'm going to set the stage by showing how he, apparently, dances around direct claims using insinuation. It's going to be important to spend some time on that because we need to be clear what I'm getting at. I never once suspected that this was some kind of massive gotcha that would, like, end Wallace's career and force him to walk off the stage in shame. That's simply unrealistic. There's too much wiggle room for using semantics to connect his story to some version of the truth, and I knew that from the start. Hell, I even stopped to acknowledge as much in my original video. Like at least three times. No, this was about the more gradual, less dramatic process of looking through details to deflate a story that appears to have been puffed up through insinuation. So when Wallace replies, well, I worked on cold cases to some extent before being a cold case detective, he's missing the whole point. See, regardless of whether he exactly comes out and says it, his presentation gives his audience every impression that he was already a full-on, exceptionally experienced cold case detective when he converted. It's this perception that drives his entire story, that lends a superficial appearance of credibility to the claim that he Sherlocked Holmes' way to Christ. Now can I prove that? Well, that's tricky because you can't exactly catch someone red-handed at the scene of the crime committing an act of insinuation. But I think we can, how do I put this? Make a strong cumulative circumstantial case that Wallace, knowingly or not, gives his narrative an air of undue credibility by communicating to his audience that he had a lot more experience than he did when he investigated Jesus. We can see one obvious example in this clip I'd covered in my original video. I analyzed their claims using every tool I possessed as a detective. I tested the Gospels as eyewitness accounts. I investigated the early history of Christianity, evaluated the nuanced differences between the New Testament texts. I even applied forensic statement analysis to the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And eventually, I started to investigate Jesus as if he was a person of interest in a no-body homicide case. Look, I didn't have the body of Jesus, and I didn't have a crime scene to provide me with any physical evidence. There weren't any fingerprints or DNA results or videos from a security camera. But none of that mattered. I'd investigated other similar cold cases as a detective. I knew I could determine the truth about Jesus, despite these deficiencies. Here Wallace is saying he'd already investigated similar cold case is as a detective when he started canvassing the Gospels for clues about Jesus. This makes it sound like he already had extensive experience, probably as an active cold case detective, right? But it doesn't exactly say that. This means that if Wallace were backed into a corner, all he'd have to do is mutter his way through remarks about how he cracked open as few as two old cases in some unofficial capacity, and his story is technically true. From a certain point of view. But of course he's insinuating a lot more than that, especially when you consider the context in which he said he worked those cases. The statement was not just a passing remark. It was a climactic declaration used to explain where he'd gotten the considerable experience needed to prove Christianity. He uses it to explain why he could approach the Gospels as a no-body investigation. Why he didn't need the body of Jesus. Didn't need a crime scene. Didn't need DNA or fingerprints or video footage. None of that mattered because he'd worked similar cold cases before. I don't think there's anybody in the world who could watch that without getting the message that he'd been some kind of hardened, experienced cold case detective before converting. Now again, I don't know he's trying to tiptoe right up to the precipice of an overt lie without actually telling one, but intentionally or not, what he's doing mimics that rhetorical strategy. He seems to dance even closer to this line in his written materials. For example, this promotion for his book, on his site, says, for 35 years, cold case homicide detective J. Warner Wallace rejected the New Testament claims about the resurrection of Jesus. 
but after applying skills he learned as an investigator, he eventually became skeptical of his atheist skepticism. Let's try to overlook the skeptical of his skepticism thing in the simply appalling use of commas. This is saying that cold case detective Wallace rejected and then found Jesus. Now I know that technically, when pressed, someone could say this was only using the title cold case detective to refer broadly to Wallace over the course of his life. Biggest stretches, that is. But look me directly in the face I don't have and tell me that a person reading that wouldn't take it as saying that he was a cold case detective at the time of his conversion. It's an obvious plain reading of the statement, and even the excuse I propose is pretty laughable. Or how about this incredibly weird blog post where Wallace says that he'd been investigating cold case homicides for 26 years. 26 years as of 2016. This would mean he'd started cold cases in 1990, two years after the force, by that I meant to say two years after joining the force, when he was almost certainly still a patrol officer. This might be the single most bizarre version of this story I've ever heard, and I'm simply shocked he ever put it into words. I mean, maybe you could say that by that point he'd, oh, I don't know, lifted up the cover of a cold case and peeked inside or something? But that's not the impression it's going to give readers. Like, not at all. If anything, this shows us how little he probably means when he says he was doing cold case work. Now, the most direct statement I found is this one, which literally says he was a committed atheist and Los Angeles cold case homicide detective when he realized he'd never really examined the evidence and so on and so forth. Now, I do want to be fair and make it abundantly clear that Wallace didn't write this. However, the person who did write it, Elisa Childers, seems to be a close associate of Wallace. Her face and name are the first things you'll see at the top of coldcasechristianity.com, and she's done multiple interviews with him. So the fact that she, of all people, could fall under this impression seems to suggest that Wallace is explaining himself in a way that gives people the wrong idea. Even worse, she said these exact words in the opening to a podcast interview with him. How did a successful Los Angeles cold case homicide detective come to faith in Christ? As a committed atheist, J. Warner Wallace set out to solve the greatest cold case in history, the truth claims made by the disciples of Jesus of Nazareth. Yet strangely, he didn't seem bothered enough to say anything about it. Curious. Not a smoking gun, but the accumulation of clues seems to suggest that Wallace inches as close as he can to this claim and sits by while surrogates openly make it for him. Now I could fill a playlist going on and on with specific examples, but that would just get repetitive. So instead I'm going to make a couple big picture points to help you see what I'm talking about. First is the way that Wallace, deliberately or not, slides back and forth across his personal timeline when telling his story. When explicitly talking about his pre-conversion career, he'll often use careful phrasing like, I'd interviewed suspects, I'd examined witness statements, or even when he wants to be so bold, I'd examine cold cases that don't really technically commit him to much of anything. But then in the next breath, he lets fly with all kinds of discussion about things he'd done, presumably later, as a full-on cold case detective. He often does this in repeated, meandering fashion without being clear about when he's switching gears. And when he does, it's pretty inevitable that allusions to his cold case experience will bleed over into his conversion story, encouraging the widespread belief that he investigated Jesus as a veteran cold case detective. If you'll just go back and watch him while looking for this, you'll notice he does it a lot. Now maybe it's not on purpose. Maybe he's just a disorganized storyteller. <laughs> yeah. But either way, whatever misunderstanding this engenders is just vital to his narrative. And to illustrate why, let's tie this all together with a little exercise. Just pause for a moment, take a deep breath, and try to forget everything you know about Wallace. Are you there yet? Nice, isn't it? Okay, now restart from the ground up with no preconceptions. And this time picture him coming to Jesus as just some basic rando cop with a total of eight years experience, much of it just as a patrol officer, probably a minimal amount of it as a detective, who maybe just started to develop a personal interest in cold cases. Suddenly his story sounds way different, right? Now I'm not claiming the way I phrase that is 100% accurate, but consider it as we go on to watch his response to my video. If we see him falling back to anything close to this to justify himself, then it becomes clear that the picture he quietly paints when backed into a corner looks a lot different than the picture he puts on full blast when promoting himself. This is extremely relevant whether or not he technically wriggled out of getting caught in a lie. Anyway, here's the response. 
He sets the stage with a couple of preliminary remarks that don't directly address my video, but allude to what I was saying. I'm going to bring something up because you mentioned this about how we try to use these de detective. When I first taught this class, Cold, Cold Case Christianity at Biola, I had a student and he was in the class and he said, you know, I got to be honest, I'm here, but I kind of think this is just a gimmick. Like, this is just a gimmick. Like, hmm. you're just like leveraging this. Like, if I was a plumber, I'd have a plumber's attitude about this whole set of collection <laughs> of evidence, right? Exactly. Because being a plumber is just as laughably unrelated to ancient textual criticism as being a detective. And I said, okay, that's fair. I think that's really fair. And I'm going to, let's wait to, let's go through the class. You know, I'll show you the approach I'm taking. And then you tell me at the end if you still think it's a gimmick. And believe it or not, this is the end of the story. I mean, you suspect he'd end with a guy coming back and saying, Oh my gosh, you just blew my mind with how much this was not a gimmick. After all, that's how these unverifiable stories about nameless skeptics usually go. But no, he just says he suspects it's a gimmick. Wallace tells him, you just wait and see, and then that was it. This feels like just randomly airing a grievance against people like me who have the gall not to take his carnival act seriously. And I've had people online, like a lot of doubters will to make, create videos or, you know, they, first of all, two things, you know, they're going to, if, if you turn, if you become a, a, a Christian at 35 and you were an atheist up to that point, mm -hmm. well, then they're going to say, we kind of do the same thing. If, if we have an atheist just as he became a Christian, we're going to say, well, he was, you know, or, or a Christian who became an atheist, we're going to say, well, I'm not sure he was ever really a Christian. Right. Well, the same thing is true on the other side. I get this all the time. Uh, he was never really an atheist. I guess it's refreshing to hear Wallace admit Christians do the same garbage thing he accuses atheists of doing, but this is unproductive behavior either way, which is why I at least don't say he was never an atheist. He could very easily have been one to the extent that any doofus who doesn't believe in gods can be called an atheist. So I have no issue with him saying he didn't believe in God. The issue is the specific way he depicts that part of his life for rhetorical purposes. He labels himself as a thoughtful non-believer, but then goes on to show his past atheist self thinking in incredibly basic ways and then responding with absurd credulity to everything said by a Christian. It's obviously just placing himself into the basic prepackaged narrative churches use to characterize non-believers. Pointing that out is totally justified and not the same as saying he was never an atheist. Well, okay, lots of people knew me on that side of this and I'm, and I, I'm, not, I'm pretty comfortable that they'll remember the jerk what, I was. Whatever. So he says that being an atheist meant he was a jerk. Nice. Whatever, it's still a distraction. It doesn't go to the issue at all, but nevertheless, it sounds compelling. Go ahead. Now this is some audacity. Wallace is always going out of his way to talk about his former atheist status. Like, constantly. It's a major showpiece of his cold case detective shtick, and the only thing along with tacked on references to detective work that makes his apologetics routine unique. Since, you know, his actual arguments literally just mimic prepackaged square one stuff that had been circulating churches for decades before he'd come along. Yet if we question something Wallace won't stop putting forward as one of his main points, we're introducing a distraction. Sure, Kokel. Well, and not only that, I just had somebody, you know, in the last, I've been in, in, in Alaska all summer, but... I live in Alaska, so it was pretty weird to hear him blurt this out. Gave me the creeps. But... I had somebody create a video that were talking about their doubt of my, my origin story because of the way I, I, our, our cold case team, all this stuff on the wall back here, it started around 2006 or seven. Mm -hmm. can't remember the exact foundation of it. For someone who endlessly talks about his cold case history and covers his wall with trophies from his cold case history and wrote books about his cold case history and made a second career out of saying he used his cold case history to help prove Jesus, Wallace has a strangely fuzzy recollection of the specifics of his cold case history. I became a Christian a decade or more earlier. So how long were you really a cold case detective? Okay, so just let me clear that up. Um, so all of us, probably across the country, 90% of, of detectives who are investigating cold cases are not cold case detectives. Why? Because that the agencies can't afford that as a special designation. Mm -hmm. So all of us uh, working in a team are usually assigned a case to work collaterally or if you're like me, I had an interest in cold cases. So let's make sure we're really pinning down the details. He gives two possible reasons someone not designated as a cold case detective might work a cold case. One, you're a regular detective who's assigned the case. Or two, you look into cold cases because you have a personal interest in one. As Wallace goes on, keep a sharp focus on which of these applies to him and when. About a year before I became a Christian, I, my dad worked a case from 1972, 10-year-old girl, 
Her name was Terry Lynn Hollis. And when she was kidnapped and murdered, it shook our community because I was about 11 when she was killed in 72. And my dad, it changed the way you allowed your kids to play in their front yard because we didn't know how she was snatched, probably from pretty close to her front yard. So it just changed our community. And it always stuck in my mind because it was never solved. So I happened to be uh, assigned as a detective uh, and I was already a senior detective. So I've been a detective for some time. Remember the time frame here. This is a year before Wallace's 1996 conversion, which is about perfectly convenient, but whatever, which places us in 1995. Since Wallace joined the force in 1998, and by that I meant 1988, this means he's saying he was a senior detective seven years after joining the force, which sounds a little far-fetched. I searched multiple sites talking about police careers in California, and it sounds like it generally takes six to eight years to become a detective. At the very least, you're supposed to have three to five years of experience as a patrol officer and a relevant degree in criminology before you can even apply. Then, after becoming a detective, it usually takes four years to get your first promotion. Now, I know this is all based on my amateur online research, and requirements vary by department. We're also dealing with a massive lack of detail coming from Wallace. But I think it's safe to say his suggestion that he'd been a detective for some time and received a promotion by 1995 sounds kind of fishy. And I, I was walking by, I was working on a surveillance team by the time, and I was walking by a detective's desk, and this had been on an old shelf, and I saw Terry Lynn Hollis. And I said, ooh, I grabbed the two notebooks off the shelf, and they were the written transcript of a young man who had confessed to killing her. And we took that guy to jail back in 73-ish, took him to court, at least to the preliminary hearing in 74. I've got a photo clip, a newspaper clip of my dad walking him across the parking lot. And he was never convicted of this. They thought, well, no, they eliminated him somehow with some primitive blood evidence. Mm -hmm. So I said, what if this is the guy? I mean, we have some technology now. Maybe this is the right guy. So I pulled that case and I started to look and do a forensic statement analysis on his about a thousand page transcript. He isn't the guy. Now, we, we worked that case off and on. It got solved in 2019. So that's a lot of years after 1972 and a lot of years after I probably picked it up in like, I don't know, 94 or 95. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember the date, but it was pretty early. He doesn't remember the date of the first case he took interest in, but it was pretty early. But fortunately for him, he managed to be sure of one thing, which is that it was the minimal year or two before his conversion that would justify him saying he'd done cold case work before investigating Jesus. Cool. And I remember, uh, now, now the, so the question is, I'm a detective working a cold case. Was I a cold case detective? No. And so what happened is we actually successfully worked several cold cases collaterally. And because they were successful and we took two to jail, one was on Fox News, one was on Dateline. They said, wow, maybe it's time now to start a team, like mm -hmm. a full-time team. Right. And they established our team. <laughs> But mm -hmm. we had been working cold cases for over a decade yeah, yeah. prior to that. All of us. And this is true anywhere in America, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. most agencies cannot afford full-time. As a matter of fact, after I retired, they closed the team. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they just can't afford them if you're not really successful. And it's really hard. This is how you were de facto cold case detective for a long time before you became an official Cold, cold case, case detective. detective. Really, and then you're going to find people on the internet that look at these records well, and they start. I guarantee about you this: it. anyone who's identifies a cold case detective on Dateline, eighty percent mm -hmm. of them are not assigned to the cold case oh, team because they don't have one. Yeah. Now you might not have noticed, but that really didn't say much. He mostly just carpet bombed us with generalities, thoughts on how an old kidnapping made him feel, and dates that either sound dubious or have nothing to do with when he started cold cases. So to sift some actual information out of this, let's remember that there are two reasons he said a non-cold case detective might end up working cold cases. The first is that they're given a case as a collateral assignment. Now Wallace gestures broadly at the fact that he was given these assignments, but he says literally nothing about when, which strikes me as a little suspicious. But fortunately it's not too hard to find clues about this if you dig a little. Because remember, my video doesn't just say that it appears Wallace wasn't a cold case detective until 2007. I also mentioned that the cold cases his commendation cites him as being involved in seemed to run from 2000 to 2011. 
Now in that video, I taken the pre-2007 ones to be cases that were already in progress when he joined. But as Wallace so helpfully explained today, he might have been assigned to these cases collaterally before officially joining the unit. So great, that gets him working cold cases before 2007. Easy peasy Wallace is off the hook, right? But wait. As some of you who are especially sharp at math might have noticed, if Wallace converted in 1996, this still means he wasn't working cold cases, even collaterally, until four years after his conversion. So his excuse appears to unravel pretty quickly once you, you know, get into actual dates. Now do we know this document includes his earliest cold cases? Well, I guess not conclusively, but it seems likely for a few reasons. First, this just seems like a reasonably natural time for him to be assigned his first cold cases, considering he probably wouldn't have made detective much earlier than that, even given a pretty brisk career progression. Second, one of his appearances on Dateline NBC actually identifies a 2000 cold case as the first one he worked on. And third, Wallace's own LinkedIn page says that he officially joined the cold case unit in 2007, and prior than that had worked cold cases starting in... Um... 2003? So like seven years after his conversion? Whoops, whoopsie. This might be why Wallace is so prone to gesture toward generalities instead of digging into actual information. But then what about cold cases worked out of personal interest? He does say he handled one of these before his conversion, right? Well, when you sift through all the puffery and the filler and get down to what he actually said, his claim is actually embarrassingly sparse. He mentions having touched one cold case about a year before his conversion or in 1994 or 95. And what did he do with this case? He grabbed a couple notebooks, looked over the transcript of a guy he suspected, and decided it wasn't him. That's it. That's what he offers as his cold case experience prior to conversion. It was an undefined amount of time later that an undefined we continue to work the case, this California paper has the case officially opening in 2000, and then it got solved in 2019 by someone he doesn't name. And I doubt it was him because I can't imagine him not very clearly saying so if it had been. So let's see what we've learned from Wallace's retort and from the record. When he, allegedly, started investigating the claims of Jesus as an atheist, was he an official cold case detective? By his own admission, no. Had he been assigned cold cases to work collaterally? He's obfuscatingly vague about this, but based on the information I can find about him, apparently no. According to him, his experience at that point amounted to having read a transcript from an old case he was personally interested in without solving anything. That's not much at all. Now I guess this meager experience can be made to square with a statement that he had cold case experience going into his Jesus investigation in the most laughably tenuous semantic way possible. But is this what he communicates to his audience? Absolutely not. His narrative is a much grander one of an atheist detective who walked into church with years of cold case experience, who had the procedural knowledge and hard-boiled no-nonsense mentality that came with it, who approached the question of Jesus' existence with highly specialized skill in building cumulative circumstantial cases without physical evidence, indeed, who needed that skill because there were no physical clues. He directly or indirectly implies all this to his audience, and it's essential that he does. Because yes, his backstory sounds way different if his cold case experience amounts to having picked up an old case file. And if that is the case, I can't imagine he'd be happy to have his audience know it. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Wallace doesn't mean to foster an inaccurate version of his story. Maybe he's just a super sloppy storyteller who doesn't realize he's giving his audience the wrong impression. I mean, I doubt it, but I'll choke this possibility down for the sake of discussion. Fine. In that case, I hope he'll take the opportunity to start being clear in how he tells his story. If he came to Jesus as a near-rookie detective with negligible cold case experience and wants his audience to know it, he can make sure they know it. No harm, no foul, this isn't about catching you in a lie. It just gives you the opportunity to fix a miscommunication. Or maybe Wallace was a more experienced detective than I think, and I just have it all wrong because I'm working with so little information. If that's the case, I would welcome him to come forward with the receipts and prove me wrong. And he has every opportunity to do this. He could tell us when he became a detective. 
He could tell us when he got a criminology degree. He could provide a list of which cold cases he worked on and when. He could clarify when he first voluntarily looked into a cold case, when he was first collaterally assigned cold cases, and he could do his best to clarify his level of involvement in each case. One of my viewers has actually tried to get this information by putting in a Freedom of Information Act request at the Torrance Police Department. Yet in spite of a 10-day turnaround time required by the state of California, they're still saying they need more time after over a month. I would encourage Wallace to save everybody the time and trouble by coming forward with this information himself. I mean, why would he not want to, right? Now this might sound like getting nitpicky over some fine details. But remember, he's the one making this an issue. He's the one making the outlandish claim that he had enough cold case experience to conclude things about a guy from the first century. He's making this all the centerpiece of his story and the foundation of his credibility. And it's pretty audacious to do that while withholding details. But even then, let's remember, it would all be for nothing if his story were true. Wallace could have had all the detective experience in the world. Hell, he could be Sherlock Holmes, Batman, Jessica Fletcher, L, and Nancy Drew all mixed into one spectacular super sleuth, and that still wouldn't budge him an inch closer to knowing the first thing about analyzing ancient texts and determining anything about Jesus. And really, that's what bothers me about this whole thing. We have a crisis of education in this country. We have a public that has no idea what a good source is or what makes someone a good authority on which topics. So by the time Wallace gets crowds full of grown adults thinking police experience qualifies someone to work as a historical and ancient textual critic, he's done a lot more than fudge on apologetics. He's actively trained people to misunderstand academic qualifications all to indulge silly conclusions on an academic topic. And he's been doing this as brazenly as any charlatan out there, regardless of his intentions. If opening up the details of this sideshow takes some air out of his story and helps bring this to light, then I'm happy to have done it. Because this needs to stop. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, Daniel Bostet, Magnus Holmgren, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.